Hey guys, Happy New Year, welcome to this first episode and the first episode in this new series of General Game Theory. Now, we're going to be taking a step back from the Godot specific tutorials and we're going to be looking at more general game theory and how that can really quickly make you a better game developer. Let's get started. Do you want to learn how to design and make games? Or maybe you want to learn how Godot works? Then subscribe to this channel and don't forget to hit that little bell icon to make sure you don't miss out on anything. Also, if you're curious about the game development that I do myself or you want to ask me any questions without using that comment box below, find me on my stream. I stream on Twitch every Tuesday and Thursday. The stream link, the schedule, everything down in that description box below. Now let's get started on that game theory, shall we? Now, the first piece of game theory that I want to discuss or have a look at with you today is the MDA framework. The MDA framework makes you aware as a game developer what the reasons for play are for players. And the reasons for play are very closely to fun or player experience. And in the end, that's what we try to deliver on. We try to deliver a certain player experience and the better we are able to deliver that, the better our game will be and the more enthusiastic our players will play it. So that's what the MDA framework will help you to do. And at the end of this video, you'll know what reasons for play exist and how you can deliver on that better and how you can make design design decision based on what you're trying to deliver on. Now, the MDA framework, MDA, stands for Mechanics, Dynamics and Aesthetics. Basically, the mechanics are the rules you have within your game. That an armor has armor value X and a sword has attack value I and that there's a formula in the game how those attack and defense interact with each other. As a simple example, the dynamics or the systems are the combat system or maybe the, the loot system or the inventory system, the item system, the dialogue system, the map system. Any system consists of several mechanics and all the systems together in the end what we try to achieve is fun, the player experience and that's what the MDA paper describes as the aesthetics of play. Now with that in mind let's go over why this view, this approach, this framework is so important for us game developers to keep our focus and after that we'll go into what the exact aesthetics, the reasons for play are. So what makes a game fun? Well it's a very easy question and a question I think every game developer should be able to answer but it's a very difficult question to answer. The question is so broad, the answer can be so broad and the answer can even be different for several different types of players that are playing the same game. So how do you determine what fun is and how can you create it as a game developer? That was, that's what the MDA framework is really trying to help with. And to, to start with how it actually does that, we have to consider a game as an artifact and how the designer and the player are interacting with that game artifact. So the designer creates the game. It looks, it, it, it decides on something it wants to create, a set of mechanics. Maybe you have, you draw inspiration from other games and you think, wow, if I combine the systems and the mechanics of those three, four, five games together, it's going to be awesome. But is it going to be awesome? How do we determine that? Well, from to know that, we have to consider the player. And the player doesn't look at the game for its mechanics or its dynamics, for its rules and its systems. A player consumes a game and it only experiences, at first, the player experience, the fun, the emotions the game invokes within the player. And that is very different from what a designer is looking at and is programming. So those are two different worlds, although we're talking about the same game. So that's very important to understand. Now when you take the game artifact and you break that down into the MDA framework, the MDA, the Mechanics, Dynamics, Aesthetics, a designer really looks at a game through what lines of code am I programming, how are those going to be interacting with each other, and then somewhere in the back is the player experience that the game designer is trying to achieve. Probably when the game designer is, is designing the game, uh, maybe in a, in a Word document or a text document, or when it's basically, you know, at the drawing board. Maybe he's aware of how all things should be coming together and create a certain player experience. But is that still the focus of the designer? 
two months in, four months in, six months in, one year in, is that aesthetic, that player experience, that fun factor, the way a player consumes a game, is that still in focus? Well, very often, designers can get sidetracked, maybe based on player feedback or, or like early player alpha tester feedback, or maybe feedback from other game designers, or maybe when several designers are coming together, they have a discussion on what mechanics they should or should not implement or how they should be implemented. Well, you need to keep a focus, and that's what this MDA framework is really good for. And the player, as I said earlier, experiences and consumes a game artifact the other way around. It first experiences the fun, and when the player plays long enough, it will discover the systems. And when the player plays even longer, it will discover the, the, the rules and the mechanics behind the systems, behind the dynamics. So that's very important to be aware of as a game designer, because this is crucial for how in the end your, your game will be experienced by players, how it will be consumed, if it's gonna be consumed at all. So with that said, let's have a look at those aesthetics, those reasons for play, there are nine in total. I'm going to go over every single one of them and give some examples along the way. So the first one is sensation. Sensation has everything to do with your senses or the senses of the player. It can be the eyes, the ears, the nose for the, the visuals, the sound or the smell. In a game, we're a little bit limited, like we don't have smell in games. So it's usually the visuals or the sound that attract players to a game. It's a reason to play a game. For example, the, the sounds in Elder Scroll games are usually considered one of the best in RPGs. And they're really a reason why some people really enjoy, it really contributes to the player experience in a considerable way. Far Cry is always known as be one of the most visually impressive games there is. And with VR, the virtual reality goggles coming in, that sensation of visual will be even brought to new heights, to new levels. Next up is fantasy. Fantasies are, or fantasy games are games where a player can experience something he or she is not able to experience in the real world. They usually play in another world or an alternative world. For example, you can travel the stars as a space capsule or an EVE Online, or you can fight in a war that has never happened in real in, in Battlefield. So these games deliver on a fantasy that the player wants to experience, but is not able to find in the real world. Then we have narrative. Narrative is a game as a drama. It basically delivers on the same sort of experience somebody can get from a movie or a book, but instead of looking and reading about characters and what they are doing, they are the character themselves. They are experiencing the story through the eyes of, of the character the player controls. So beautiful examples of narrative are, for example, the Elder Scrolls. Although you can choose to skip the storyline, the storyline itself is, is very in-depth and it really gets you on the edge of your chair. And I've often played Elder Scroll games that I'm like, okay, I'm gonna finish after five minutes, but then I get a new quest. And I'm so curious how this quest is gonna end up and, 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 and what more I'm gonna discover about the story. Like that kind of gameplay where, where a quest line or a storyline can really get you at the edge of your chair or keep you awake all night long. Those are perfect examples of game that deliver on narrative, deliver drama through it, and that the player really feels like, what's gonna happen next? I want to know. Then we get challenge. Challenge can be described as game as obstacle. And it's very important to note that challenge is not the same as difficulty because difficulty is basically just making the same obstacle more difficult through changing some parameters, but it's actually not providing you with a new obstacle to discover, explore, and overcome every single time again and again and again. Perfect examples of obstacle games or challenge games are for example, puzzle games, and Candy Crush, for example, might sound silly, but it's absolutely true. Candy Crush has a very basic set of mechanics. There's no difficulty setting, setting in, in Candy Crush at all. And even though the mechanics are pretty, sim pretty sim similar in every single round and every single level, just by changing the map a little bit, just by changing the stones, the stones changing every single time you make an attempt, creates every time for a little bit of a different obstacle, a different way, and a feeling of satisfaction when you've been able to overcome that obstacle. So Candy Crush is a perfect example as game as obstacle course, and that's really what Challenge provides. Also, I believe like back in the days, the, the Doom, where you could walk around and head all the corners, is a little bit similar. It has 
the same um, NPCs in the same locations every time, but every level is like an obstacle course. How am I going to go through it? And those games are even played today, but then consider how fast can you run at speed runs? How fast can you do it? How fast can you overcome the obstacles? So that's really game as a challenge. And overcoming the challenge is what brings a player um, to the game. It's what creates the fun for the player. Where challenge often deals with challenge uh, in an environment, again, or against NPCs, competition is the opposite of um, where who you interact with. Competition really comes from a sort of primal drive of us human beings to dominate over others, to show that we're better, to best somebody else. Games like Tekken, for example, or any other fighting game are perfect examples where two players go up against each other with controllers and really trying to fight it out, looking who is best, who is a better master over this game. And mastery of a game is very often seen. Basically, any game where you have competition in, StarCraft, for example, also perfect case example where competition is really a core driver of the game and where playing with other players is almost a necessity for, for really experiencing the game as the game was intended by the designers. So that's competition. Now, close to competition where people are pitted against each other, the next one, fellowship, is where players are brought together to overcome something within the game or to experience the game or to live the fantasy. Perfect examples of where fellowship is very strong game element are, of course, MMORPGs with all the clans and the guilds and the, the party systems, the chat systems, the inboxes and the mail systems. All those things together create that social framework that in the end you can say, my, my World of Warcraft friends or my EVE Online friends or my Final Fantasy Online friends. You know, you can actually say, I made friends there. And I mean, crazy as it is, we all know the stories of even marriages coming out of, of people meeting online through video games. Well, those are perfect examples of social frameworks where people come back to a game because of the social interactions they have had in the past or they expect to have because they already made friends there. And next up is discovery. Discovery is basically anything or any game element that lets you explore and discover and unfold. And discovery is pretty broad. It's not only about finding every single cave in an Elder Scroll game. It's also about discovering how um, the, the, the systems work, actual systems, the dynamics of the game, exploring those and discovering the inner workings of the game mechanics and thereby getting a competitive advantage over other gamers can actually be part of, of discovery. You discovered something within how the game works that's going to make you a better player and that, that gives a huge thrill to some players. That's really why they sometimes play play, sometimes players play a game or discovering how certain strategies can work in, in um, StarCraft or in um, Red Alert, uh, a game which is still being played for that very reason. So it's that discovery of mechanics, discovery of possibilities, discovery in a geographical sense, uh, discovery of exploring every item. Um, and that's, that's usually even supported sometimes, but for example, an achievement system, which is a, a system, a dynamic within a game. Through achievements, you can let a player low, know and, and, and make him feel, um, make his discovery feel valued, as in you've almost reached this achievement, you're almost there, and then once the player hits it, it's like, you're awesome. And that really gives that kick, it gives that fun factor, that reason to play for that player. Then next up is expression. And expression really uh, dives into a, 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 a primal be, um, necessity of human beings that we want to express our individuality. We want to show who we are. And a great example of, of, of two games that do this very differently or where one doesn't do it and the other does is World of Warcraft and Final Fantasy Online. In World of Warcraft, you have like all the armors and the outfits and very often on MMORPGs, I'm not sure if this is true in World of Warcraft, you can actually craft um, items with certain stats to have the aesthetics, the look of another piece of equipment so you can wear your favorite armor set without having to sacrifice um, stats or armor or defense because you, you wanted to wear that armor set. It's, it's a way that a game designer allows to express a player however he wants to express himself through clothing. But also a class system is a great way of expression of who you are, what kind of player you are. Are you the helping player that 
is heeding everybody else or are you the dark necromancer that is gangs people or whatever you know and the reason why i took world of warcraft and, and final fantasy online is in final fantasy online you don't really have armor what you have in final fantasy is costumes there's dozens of costumes in final fantasy online and they only have a very limited contribution to to combat mechanics but all the costumes allow for a certain expression of the player the player can really like take Final Fantasy Online with its costumes as a wardrobe and, and dress up as they want to express themselves in the world. It's a great example of an, 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 an online multiplayer game that that lets go of the discovery element a little bit, discovering all the different armors and how that interacts with combat and focusing more on expression and how armor can be used as a way of expressing oneself in the community. So beautiful examples of, of how expression can actually be used within games or how mechanics and systems can be created to allow players to express themselves. And then finally, last but not least, is app negation. And app negation is called in the MDA player, I believe, submission. Uh, but I believe app negation is a better word. I actually did not think of this. That's uh, from extra credit video. You can find it on YouTube as well. So app negation is basically anything that has to do with just pastime, just to zone out. You know, when you when you come home from work, you had a long day, you had a couple of meetings and you just don't want to think about work. You don't want to think about all the stuff you have to do and you just play FIFA online or FIFA 2019 or whatever for a couple of hours or you just grind some more gear in World of Warcraft or grind some levels in Lineage. You know, all those moments that, that you're just basically on a repeating mode. You're not really discovering anything new. You're just you're just playing, you're just pastiming, you're just, you're just zoning out. Well, if a game delivers on that, that can be a reason to play, um, even though my, it may seem at first to, to, to be a really weird reason. There's actually a lot of people very stressed out in the world these days because of work, and a lot of people just wanna zone out for a moment with the game and not actually have to think really hard or, or interact with other people. Like sometimes people just wanna zone out, they just wanna chill, they just wanna relax, they just wanna abnegate. And, a game can be a, a very good way to do that, but then the game mechanics and dynamics do need to support that possibility. So, wow, that's a, a lot of talking and a lot of information about the reasons to play, the nine reasons to play, or the aesthetics that we see in the MDA framework. Now, what can you actually do with that? Or what should we actually know about this first? Well, first of all, there's very, very, very few players that seek all aesthetics within a single game at a single time. Usually players play a specific game. Some people love RPGs usually because there's so much discovery in them. And some people really like MMORPGs specifically because they really love the social system. And other people just want to zone out and that's maybe why they like FIFA. So it's very rare that a game has to deliver on every single aesthetic at the same time for every player. In fact, you definitely do not want to do that because you're just burdening players with so much experience, but a lot of experience which you're actually not looking for in that moment. So it's very important that most games have some elements of every of the nine aesthetics, but they deliver on only two, three, rarely four or more core aesthetics. The core aesthetics is what really drives the game, what really is their above all the other experiences. And that's really what you have to be aware of. If, especially if you're a first time developer, beginning developer, hobby developer, you've not got a huge studio with 200 people, then you only want to focus on two, three, probably not even four, don't even try it. Core aesthetics that you want to deliver through the mechanics and the dynamics of your game. That way you really approach a very specific market, but those players will be able to recognize your game for what it is. There's one very good um, exception of this rule, and that's Minecraft. Because Minecraft has basically, I believe it delivers very well on six or seven of the aesthetics on that list. So it, it delivers on much more. But with Minecraft, what the beauty is of Minecraft, and I think at the same time what the success is of Minecraft, it doesn't force the player to get every aesthetic at the same time. You can decide, <coughs> excuse me, to hop online with some of your friends on your own server and set yourself the challenge, the obstacle, the challenge to create a beautiful castle. 
but there's no competition. It's mostly social framework at that point. Um, and you don't do anything regarding discovery or anything. You're just building a castle. But then other players might activate the game and, and play a survival mode uh, session. And, and they are, are discovering the world and discovering the different biomes and they're looking for their temples. And, and, and some people might also take on the challenge to go into the nether and to defeat the dragon. And, you know, the beauty of Minecraft is that a lot of aesthetics are in there, but you actually don't have to engage with every single one at the same time because Minecraft just leaves you to it. It's an open world. It's like you decide what you do. You, you log online today and you want to defeat the dragon. Well, here you go. Here's the challenge. Here's the obstacle course. Or do you want to go online today, but maybe play with some friends? Okay, go to a server and do something else. You know, it's very different um, way of, of serving the player experience. Basically, Minecraft doesn't serve a player experience. Minecraft gives you the options of player experiences to choose from. It's more like several games into one. But definitely don't try to recreate a Minecraft because it's extreme, extraordinarily difficult to even get four core aesthetics delivered well in your game. And you can even wonder whether it's actually going to help your game or not. So with all that information now given to you, what can you do with it? Well, it's actually quite easy when you think about it, but it might be very hard to practice what you preach. First of all, you have to determine what aesthetics, what reasons to play your game is going to be delivering on. Choose two, choose three. Choose like, okay, I want to make a platformer that has, has a narrative story that gets the player on the edge of their chair and, and really delivers on challenge. Like that's very common. Uh, uh, like platformers are very often games as an obstacle course. So challenge is very uh, often a core element of a platformer. Maybe you really want to compare, compare uh, compare combine it with narrative like create an amazing story within your platformer reasons why maps are linked to each other and, and levels and stuff like that or maybe you want to deliver uh, uh, deliver also on discovery have a huge map system and give the player the freedom to 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 choose different maps um, thereby giving him the idea that he can discover different places instead of having more lined up linearly um, so yeah, that, that's like the first thing you have to do. Once you have determined those aesthetics, those reasons for play, you have to determine how the systems are going to be creating that experience. Because remember, the aesthetic of play comes from all the systems underneath. And on the, underneath every single system, there's a whole bunch of mechanics, a whole bunch of systems or rules in place to make that system work. So once you know the aesthetics, you can determine how the dynamics are going to deliver on the aesthetic. And then once you know which systems you need and how, and how the system should contribute to the aesthetics, you know how to make design choices within your mechanics, within the rules of your game that are so going to support um, the aesthetics that you wanted to deliver to the player. And then finally, always very important to get feedback on your game, on your development, feedback from other developers when you're maybe in early development and feedback from players once you are in, in later stages and in, in early delivery. So when you send out that material to a feedback group, you just don't want to say, hey guys, let me know what you think of it. That's a very open question, but every player, every developer, every, every, every tester is going to approach your game from a different angle. If they don't know what you try to deliver on, then it's very hard for them to give specific feedback, which is actually going to be helpful for you. And if you just ask the open-ended question, hey, let me know what you think, then probably you're gonna have so many conflicting replies from different people that test your game that you still don't really know what to do. And then the feedback session wasn't really that helpful. So when you send out something for feedback, ask if they have experienced the aesthetics, if they experienced the reasons to play as you have intended the experience to be, as you had intended the aesthetics to be. That way you get much better feedback than you would otherwise get. And that better feedback will in turn result in better changes and in the end a better game, a better player experience and therefore you being a better developer. So that being said, let's take a very, very, very simple example and on two aesthetics within a dialogue system and how that can play out. So a simple example, imagine we have, we decided as aesthetics, we decided to develop a game that tries to deliver a narrative. So our dynamics is we could say, okay, to drive the narrative forward, 
we're gonna have dialogue within the game. So the player will be able to interact with NPCs and the NPCs will give them information and the NPCs and the dialogue system will drive the story forward. So that, that, that could be a, a valid dynamic. And the mechanic, like the design choices we have to make with the dialogue box, is that we want to implement cliffhangers and, and open-ended questions and, and incomplete information, maybe even misinformation sometimes. We want to make sure that once the player interacts with an NPC and has a dialogue, it's not like the player knows everything. It's just like a movie and a book. Remember, narrative is very similar to those two medias. Like, it's not like a, a, a character in a movie in the first 15 minutes is going to go have a conversation with another character and, and the whole climax of the movie is within the first 15 minutes. No, the climax of the movie is in the end. And there's all kinds of cliffhangers as we go through the movie. And that's what makes a good movie. That's what gets us at the edge of the chair and, and sitting and being concentrated. And whenever somebody starts talking, we say, shh, don't talk. I want to see the movie, you know, that, that excitement, that, that thrill of a movie. We want to create the same in the, in the game. And we can do that through those different methods. So what we try to do is we create curiosity. When the player has a conversation or has a dialogue, we don't tell everything. Actually, we give even more questions back to the player. Like a player will have a, will maybe have two questions answered, but we'll have four more questions going out of the dialogue moment. And that way the player will go forward, trying to discover more things that, that's gonna happen. And that will drive the story forward. So that's how our dialogue system is going to look. But let's, let's, let's take another example. What if we develop a game, but we try to deliver on fantasy? Fantasy as the aesthetic. Then the dynamic is that one of the ways we can deliver that fantasy is that through uh, dialogue. We, we, so we, we again create a dialogue system. But however, we now we design the dialogues with as many possible replies that the player can give, like many options to choose from, and create a whole dialogue system and have the whole system prepared so that the player feels that he can express his or her own opinion and feelings within the role, within the fantasy that the player plays. So let's say the player is playing, I don't know, this is not actually an evil line, but let's say Evil Online was designed to deliver on fantasy through dialogue. It's actually not the case, but imagine it would. Imagine Evil Online, so it's a space game. The, 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 the player decides, okay, I'm gonna play a space pirate, so I'm gonna be killing other people. So you want that player to have that option of, of piracy, of maybe boarding a ship or asking for ransom within the dialogue options, if he would be interacting with NPCs, for example. But you also want to have players that maybe feel like, oh no, I want to be the freedom fighter and I want to kill the, pir the pirates and I want to save the people. Well, you also need options for that so that both players, a player that wants to play the pirate and a player that wants to play the safe uh, keeper or the, 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 yeah, the safe keeper, the guardian, that they both have the options within their dialogue box so that they feel like they can stay within the fantasy role that they had envisioned themselves playing in. So that's delivering on fantasy through the dialogue system. So in both cases, but in a game with both narrative and fantasy, a valid system to support that aesthetic is a dialogue system. But the way we create that dialogue system, the actual rules of the dialogue system become different based on the aesthetics we have chosen. And that's why it's so incredibly important to start with the end in mind, to start with the player experience in mind, to the start with the aesthetics in mind that you want to deliver on. Because only when you know that the aesthetics, the player experience you actually want to create, once the game is finished, only then you know which design choices you should make while you program and design your game during the development phase. And if you are aware of that, if you're aware of this, and if you do that, you'll instantly become a better game developer. And it doesn't matter whether you're at the end of your game development or at the beginning of the game development of the game you're currently making. You can apply this at any point of time. When you're already almost done with your game, you can test whether you have designed everything according to this MDA framework. And when you're just starting out, you can already start designing according to the MDA framework. So in any case, at any moment you are within your game development um, cycle at the moment of, of the game you're currently working on, you can use this to improve your game. So that's it for today, guys. That's the MDA framework. It, I hope this has been a huge help to you 
as much as it was a huge help for me when I first found out about this, uh, this MDA framework. If you like this video, then please smash that like button, hit subscribe, and don't forget to check out that Twitch channel if you ever want to discuss uh, game development or want to see what I'm doing myself. I'm not going to be continuing this game theory series every single week. I'm going to be combining it parallel with some Goda tutorials. So those are going to be coming up as well. And I'll probably do one of these game theories videos, maybe once every, maybe once every month, as I think they are a little bit more abstract than, than my other videos. So yeah, I'll be combining the two of them together. Hope to see you next time. And until then, keep on gaming, keep on coding. See you later, guys.